so thankful for this wonderful, this powerful time of worship that the Lord has given to us. What a great privilege it is to come week after week and enjoy the presence of God with fellow believers and how our hearts and our hopes stirred so powerfully with the words of the songs we sing and what a preview this is of coming attractions when one day we will sing and this will literally become the reality of our lives. Can't wait for that day. Well, thank God for the glorious hope that the Lord has given to us in our lives. A warm welcome to all of you, especially all the guests that are here for the first time. We welcome you to our church. We are so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us this afternoon. We are going through a series through the book of Acts known as Church on the Rise. And today we are ending chapter 3. And I'll read for you from verses 17 through 26 as we enter into God's word. Acts chapter 3, verses 17 through 26. Uh, God's word reads like this. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant... He sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Uh, just like the sermon that he preached in Acts chapter 2, there's no reason to think that this is the entirety of what Peter spoke in, uh, on this day. The day when this beggar was healed, this lame man was healed so miraculously by the power of God. But the Holy Spirit has given to us a kind of a summary of his sermon and probably the exact words that he wanted to communicate to the church of all generations are given to us, written to us in God's word. Even in Acts chapter 2, we see that, that Peter spoke many other words, but what is known and, to, and for us to understand is given to us in Acts chapter 2. What we saw last week is the way in which the Holy Spirit was now tearing their hearts apart. And now the healing part. The conviction has already happened in the previous verses up to verse 16 that we read about. In which the Holy Spirit was coming and reminding them that the very one that they had been longing for. The one that the Old Testament prophets had so longed for. According to Old Testament prophecy, he suffered and died. Yet you did not recognize him. You abandoned him. You disowned him. You killed the God of life, the author of life. And all these charges are being leveled against him. Even at this very moment as they are going to pray in the very temple. And in the very place where he stood and said, I and the father are one. And they wanted to stone him to death. Now they are recognizing that the very one that they tried to kill was the one that had been told about them all throughout the Old Testament writings. So the Holy Spirit has already done the work of conviction. And look at the way now the Holy Spirit turns to heal them and to bring them back to the place where God wants them to be. And this should be a component of all of our gospel preaching as well. We never, as I mentioned towards the end of my sermon last week, we never sugarcoat the gospel. We tell people exactly what the depravity in their life is. But then we also, just like God's word does, offers them grace and forgiveness that is only found in the person and in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we come to verse 17 and look what Peter says. He says to them in, in, the, in the NIV, he says, brothers, here you say, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leader. So after telling them about all the ways in which they completely went in the opposite direction and completely missed the mark on recognizing the true servant of God, the Messiah, the promised one, the one they've been waiting on. He tells them, brothers, there's a word of endearment there. Trying to identify himself with the people that he is talking to. 
Peter is not standing on a pedestal and saying, oh, you ignorant Israelites, you men, brood of vipers. He's not using any of those words in his sermon. The word that is used is one where he identifies with them and says, my fellow Israelites, my brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your leaders did. Even in our communication of gospel message to others, don't come to them in a pedestal. Don't come acting like you are all good and they're all bad. You are self-righteous. You know, you are perfect. And these are the people that are so sinners that I'm communicating the gospel to. While that might be the reality of your position in Christ, understand we are only children of God because of the grace of God. We are only children of God because of the forgiveness of God. It is only because the Holy Spirit came and opened our dark hearts to the truth of God that we became children children of God. It's not because we were born righteous. It is not because we were born more intelligent. It is not because you were smarter. It is not because you were more holy. It is only the grace of God that made you to be a child of God. So hear that. We see in the man of God as well. My dear brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. It is because you were ignorant about who he was. And I often think about this quite a bit. What if you and I were living in the first century. Would we have recognized Jesus? I think about that all the time. If I was going to that temple every single day and worshiping, and I had read all of the Old Testament, and I was waiting for the Messiah to come and, and, to, and to rescue me from the, uh, from the clutches of all the slavery and all the prison that was going on, here comes an ordinary carpenter's son from Galilee. He is coming and telling me that he is God. And all of my life I have believed that God is one and no one else is God. And here's a man in front of me telling me I'm God. I'll be picking up the stones too to throw at him. See, before you cast stones at the people of the first century, understand the background they're coming from. That exactly what Peter is saying. You acted in ignorance just as your leaders. The Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 8, told us the same thing. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not crucify the Lord of glory. It is out of ignorance that they crucified the Lord. If they truly understood who he was, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. So ignorance. So here is God's offer of forgiveness that you, off, that you did something out of ignorance. Not only that. What happened to the life of Jesus was out of ignorance. But also, if you think that you actually planned all these things, no, it was the plan of God. Look at verse 18. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. See, you are just instruments in the hands of a sovereign God who was fulfilling his plan and his purpose and everything that he had prophesied. That does not mean that you're not guilty. But all that it means is that what has happened to him was also the plan of God. You should feel sorry for what you did, but you should not feel sorry for what happened to him. There's a difference between the two. You should feel sorry for what you did and your role in killing Jesus, but you should not feel sorry for what happened to him because that was the plan of God. If you had read the scriptures carefully, if you had understood what he was talking about, as we talked about last week, all of Jeremiah, all of Isaiah was telling you that the Messiah had to suffer. He had to suffer before he could be glorified. And so you know it is not only the prophets that foretold that. When you look at verse 22 and 23 of the same chapter, he goes all the way back to Moses and says, Moses even foretold that this prophet would come. The Lord your God will raise you up a prophet just like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. It is not only the prophets foretelling about the suffering. Your great leader, Moses, the one whom you revere and the one who made you to come out of the land of Egypt from all his slavery foretold that one day a prophet will come just like him. You should listen to what he has to say. Because while I am able to bring you out of the bondage in Egypt, the one, this prophet, will bring about redemption from the eternal bondage. And he has come to be the greatest prophet of all. And not only that, indeed, verse 24 and 25, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made you with your father Abraham through your offspring. 
all peoples on earth will be blessed. So what is Peter doing here? He's taking apart every single thing that is near and dear to the heart of the Jewish people. And he's highlighting how every single one of these lives were pointing to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was all about Jesus. Samuel was all about Jesus. Here we see Abraham, the blessings of the nations would come through him. And that offspring is Jesus who had come, the one whom you crucified. And then in verse 26, he tells them, when God raised up his servant, referring to Jesus, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each one of you from your wicked ways. So all of these things that have happened in the last couple of months have all been the plan of God. God foretold it. God ordained it. God made it to happen. This was not an accident. God had been planning it for the last 4,000 years. Now it has come to fruition. But here is the good news. All of this was done to turn you back from your wicked ways. So here is what you are supposed to do. Two things you need to understand. You acted in ignorance. All that has transpired was the predetermined plan of God. Then here is the message of grace. God is not done with you. Yes, you have done a lot of things in ignorance. But you need to understand one thing. It was our ignorance you did it. And not only that, you were only fulfilling the plan of God. Don't be so sad about everything that happened. This is for your own good. God is not done with you. What are you supposed to do? Verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. God is not done with you. You still have a second chance. You still have a chance to turn to him and receive from him sudden blessings. Look at what the Holy Spirit is doing here. The Holy Spirit is reaching them at the very level they are and telling them, God is not done with you. See, this is very, very important in our preaching, in the way we approach this. And this is exactly what God wants us to do. Howard Hendricks, who used to be the president at Dallas Seminary, tells a story of a young man who strayed from the Lord, but was finally brought back by the help of a friend who really loved him. When there was full repentance and restoration, Dr. Hendricks asked this young man, Christian, how it felt away from the Lord. The young man said, it seemed like I was out at sea, in deep water, in deep trouble, and all his friends were on the shore, hurling biblical accusations at him, about justice, penalty, and wrong. So listen to this. He says, I was out in the sea, drowning, deep sea, deep trouble. All of my friends were on the shore, hurling verses at me about biblical judgment, accusations, and penalty. Then he said, but there was one Christian brother who actually swam out to get me and would not let me go. I fought him. But he pushed me aside, my fighting, grasped me, put a life jacket around me, and took me to shore. By the grace of God, he was the reason I was restored. He would not let me go. Oftentimes, way too many of us are just content with standing at the shore. Seeing the drowning man and speaking our scripture after scripture to him without really Going to him at the very place where he's and saying, my brother, look, I was a sinner as well. It is only the grace of God that saved me. Come, putting our hands around him and grasping him and saying, come to church, come to Bible study, come to small groups and not letting go until he comes. That kind of ministry has effectiveness. What a lot of people need in the world is a compassionate voice. Is a tender heart. Is an understanding spirit. Is one who says, I am not better than you. It is only the grace of God that has saved me. That same grace is available for you as well. That's exactly what Peter did here. He told them, out of ignorance you did this. It was foretold by all the prophets. But God is not done with you. God wants you to do two things. Repent and return to him. There are a lot of people that preach the gospel today without any mention of repentance. But when you study apostolic preaching of the New Testament, these two things are important in the lives of every true gospel preaching. 
repent and return to the Lord. These are two different Greek words. What is the difference between repent and return? Repent literally means a change of heart or mind about something. Whether it be sin, in this case, an understanding of the Messiah. Who Jesus was. They were wrong about him. They are now supposed to repent and recognize who he truly is. That's repentance. But that is not enough. They also have to run to him. Return to him. Go to that one that you rejected and ask for forgiveness. And he will do certain great things in your life. If you repent, turn your idea about the state that you're in. And you return to the Lord. You will have forgiveness and all the blessings that Peter talks about in this section. Remember the prodigal son. As he went away from the father's house, first thing that happened to him is what? Repentance. What did he say? In my father's house, they are wasting away food. And here I am dying of hunger. That is a change of heart about the father's house. See, in his life, in his mind, he thought that the faraway land was better than the father's house. That is why he left the father's house. Now having gone to the faraway land and wasted everything, he realizes what? The father's house was always better than the faraway land. That is repentance. Recognizing that the presence of God is better than the things of this world. Recognizing that Jesus is better than anything the world will give to us. That Jesus is better than my sin. Jesus is better than my addiction. Jesus is better than my pleasure. Jesus is better than any kind of evolution of my heart that is far away from the teachings of God and what the will of God is. It is repentance. But not only that. Look what the prodigal son does. He walks back to the father's house. Both these things are necessary. What if the prodigal son only did this? He is sitting in a faraway land and he thought to himself, I messed up. In my father's house, they're wasting away food. Here I'm dying of hunger. But he remained in the faraway land. See, he would never receive the embrace of the father. That's why in God's word, Peter says, repent and return to the Lord. And that's what will happen. First thing that will happen, look at the blessings that are promised in this section to the nation of Israel specifically, but to all of us if we repent and return to the Lord. First thing, your sins will be wiped out. I love that word, wiped out. It literally means to take a blackboard where all of your sins are written up. And here comes God when you return to him. He takes an eraser and he completely erases everything that is written on the blackboard. In fact, in the olden days, in the papyrus or in the animal skin where they would write things. The ink of that day did not have any acid in it. So because of that, the ink would not penetrate into the writing material. It would only stay on the surface. It was really easy. If you want to use the same material that was very costly, all you had to do was wipe away the ink and there would be nothing of that writing that would remain upon the writing material. That's how the ink was and that's how the writing material was of the old. That's why it had to be preserved and taken care of so well so that it would not erase away. But here what we are seeing is the same picture. God comes into your life filled with all the sins and all the blemishes and all the things you've done in the past. And God's word still says to you, if you repent and return to me, I will come and blot out your sins, wipe away your sins, erase them completely that when people look at you, when God looks at you, there is no sin anymore. Many a times, even after God has forgiven our sin, we still go back to God and say, God, forgive my sin. And you know what the response of God is? What sin? Because he has forgotten it. My God not only forgives, but he does something that is impossible for human beings to do. He forgets our sin. You can forgive others, but you cannot forget. Because we have a memory. You cannot erase your memory. Only God has the ability to forgive and forget your sins and not remember them anymore. Otherwise, with every dealing that you have with God, your past sins would come into the mind of God. In a supernatural way, God is able to remember not our sins no more. He is able to wipe them out, but it starts with repentance and returning to the Lord. Oh, what gracious God we serve. Then he says to them, not only will I wipe away your sins, if you as a nation 
Remember, this is talking to the, not only the people, the entire nation of Israel is being spoken to by Peter here. God will give you a time of refreshing as well. Very specifically, this is biblical prophecy. It is talking about the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have time this morning, afternoon to go into it in much detail. But when you study biblical prophecy, you understand that it is the restoration of Israel ultimately that will usher in the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. That's something that is going to happen in the future. But on that day, the whole nation did not turn back to him. Only a few thousand did. So the work of the gospel continues. Thank God for that. The gospel would come to the Gentiles and God's kingdom continues to move on in the world. But there will be a time when the nation of Israel will be fully restored to the Lord. And then God will reign on this earth. The time of refreshing that Peter is talking about. God will bring about a time of refreshing. Look at Acts chapter 3 verse 20. That he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you even Jesus. So not only does God wipe away our sins. God will send you a time of refreshing like no other. When he will come and reign among his people. And look who is coming. The Messiah is going to come and reign again. He is basically telling them if you will repent and turn to him. Not only will you have your sins forgiven. You will ex experience the coming of his kingdom. But not only the coming of his kingdom. The coming of the king as well. As he will come to reign in righteousness. You are going to be given a second chance. You are going to be given a chance to once again worship him as the Lord that he is meant to be worshipped. Remember, they missed the mark in the first time. They, out of their ignorance, they did not recognize him as the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Peter is telling them, if you repent and turn back to him, he will wipe away your sins. His kingdom will come and the king will also come and you will have a chance to worship him again. Risk time, not in ignorance, but recognizing he for who he is. And then he continues verse 21. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Look at the beauty of God's word. Heaven must receive him. Who? Jesus. Until the time he will come back again to establish his kingdom on this earth as foretold by the prophets. Why did uh, Peter make this statement? Heaven must receive him until the time he is to come back. See, there was a false teaching that was going on among the Jewish people of that time. That when the Messiah comes... That he will be on this earth and he will reign forever. They missed the first coming. They're looking at the second coming and missing the mark. Look at John chapter 12 verse 34. They actually talked about this. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? In their mind when the Messiah comes, what? He's going to remain on earth forever. So when the son of man is saying, I must be lifted up, they're like, wait a minute, then you are not the Messiah. Because the Messiah that we know is supposed to remain forever. So Peter in his sermon is telling them, he is lifted up because heaven must receive him for a time until the time comes for the father to send him back again. Today, what we are experiencing is the Son of God, the, the Lord Jesus Christ being received by the Father, sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for us. And aren't you glad today that heaven has received him? He has become our high priest. He has become our interceder. And a time is soon coming when he will come back again to establish his kingdom on this earth that is going to happen soon and very soon. Whether you believe it or not, it is going to happen again. 80% of the prophetic word in God's word has happened literally to the very word without any kind of deviation from God's word. If something has happened already 80% without any variation, you will be a fool to think that the other 20% will not happen. 
What I mean by that is that I believe in the literal thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. I, rem I believe in a time when my Lord's feet will stand on Mount Olive. I believe on a time when he will come and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. He will reign over the nations of the world. Because if his first coming is a historical fact, then his second coming is a historical fact And well. My God does not speak in obscurity. My God does not speak in allegory. My God does not speak in vague language. He, when he says he will come again, he will come again. And all eye will see him. All knee will bow before him. And everyone will turn to him as the one that appears. He will reign and he will reign forever. This is the message of the gospel. That time of refreshing is coming. Repent and turn to him that his sins will be forgiven. You know why? If your sins are not forgiven, you will have no part in the kingdom that is coming. You will no part, no part in the reign of the king that is soon coming. And not only that, Peter tells them, there will be restoration like never before. Look at the four things that is promised in God's word. Sins wiped out. Times of refreshing. Return of the Messiah. Complete and complete restoration. You and I are living in a broken world today. A world that's messed up. A world that needs a lot of healing. None of the governments, none of the political parties, none of the leaders of this world can bring about a solution to the problems of the world. But you know what we have in God's word? A promise. He came once. He will come again. He came once to bring us salvation. He will come again to take his children to be himself and to reign as the rightful king of this universe forever and ever, even on this earth. A few years ago, PBS ran a series called Civilizations. And they talked about how among the ruins of the Mayan city of Mexico are 6,500 buildings that are laying in ruins. The tallest is a massively decorated temple whose steps climb to 180 feet, the height of a 15-story building. And talking about these ruins of all these buildings, one commentator said this. Ultimately, he said, all civilizations want exactly what they cannot have the conquest of time. So they build bigger, higher, grander, as if they could build their way out of mortality. It never works, he says. There always comes a moment when the most populous of cities with their markets and temples and palaces and funeral tombs are simply abandoned. And at the coming of the Lord Terry's, Dallas also will lay in ruins one day. Every nation crumbles eventually. Every nation does. No nation, no cities remain forever. All nations come to an end. But there is a government which will stand the test of time. Isaiah wrote, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Of the increase of his government. Who is talking about? The one who came as the promised Messiah. There will be no end. Oh, what a day that's going to be. There will be peace. No war. Joy. Not just joy. The Bible says fullness of joy. Holiness. Everywhere. Holiness. Can you imagine? Glory. Fully revealed. Comfort, the king himself will personally make sure that every need of your life is taken care of. Justice, perfect justice for everyone. Knowledge, complete knowledge. Oh, instruction, the king himself will teach everyone. Knowledge and wisdom, the Bible says, will fill the earth. No curse, the curse will be mitigated in the animal kingdom and in the natural realm. That's why it says, the lion and the lamb will lay together. Talking about thousand year reign.
no sickness because the king is a healer. No deformity because the king has made all things whole. All these things will happen. The Bible says if someone at that time dies at 100 years, they die as an infant. Freedom from oppression. No attacks against the enemy. Prosperity, no want. An increase of light. It all comes from God. Directly from the face of God. This is what is promised for us. This is not make-believe. This is not mythology. This is not fairy tale. As I mentioned just a moment ago, the same God who foretold the coming of the Messiah the first time is the one that is telling you such a time is coming on the face of the earth. So our message to all of our hearts is this. Repent and return to the Lord while He may be found. And our message to a broken world is also this. Repent and return to the Lord. We celebrate births. Right? And that's a beautiful thing. We rejoice when our parents have children. And we have had the privilege of seeing babies born in our families very recently. But you know what the greatest miracle is? It's not being naturally born. It is being born again. And in our church last Sunday, we had a miracle that happened. A miracle that happened. And I'm here to tell you that miracle. Last Sunday after church, I walked out. Young man came to me crying. His parents thought he was in trouble. He said, Pastor, during your sermon today, I accepted the Lord as my Savior. Joshua, will you come forward? There were tears flowing from his eyes. He told me he gave his heart to the Lord. Benoit and Simi thought that he was in trouble that, and I was getting on to him and that's why I was crying. No, he was crying because the Spirit of God was working in his heart. And I asked him, tell me, what part of the sermon touched your heart to give your heart to the Lord? You know what he told me? He said, when you mentioned the fact that the beggar did not have any faith, but God still healed him and made him to walk again. He said, I thought in my heart, even my little faith, God can save me. And I gave my heart to the Lord. That's a childlike faith. And I've never thought of that passage as a message of salvation. But look at the way the Holy Spirit works. Look at the way the Holy Spirit works. Your faith, God has honored it. And has made you a child of God. Because you believed in the sinless sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for your sins. And we as a family rejoice for the fact that Christ is born in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask our pastor to come forward and his grandfather, who is also a pastor, to join me on the stage um, as we pray for our dear Joshua. Every eye closed. <laughs> From every heart, sincere thanksgiving rising up to God. Hallelujah. An earnest prayer. At this moment, for our very dear Joshua oh, Phillips. Yeah. And then rejoicing for all our children and praying for them. Father in heaven, the eternal one, our creator, God in whose image we are all created. We thank you as we lift up our hearts together, Amen. wondering at your love, greatness, Amen. and your great work. Amen. Thank you, O oh God. That the greatest work you do in our lives Amen. Hallelujah. is making us new Praise in Jesus God. Christ. Hallelujah. We as a church family, Amen. 
in all humility amen lift up our hearts together amen giving you thanks amen. for our dear joshua amen we thank you amen for in eternity amen even before the foundation amen. of the world hallelujah in jesus christ amen. our savior hallelujah you set him apart amen. to be your own amen knowing so well that sin would come into the world amen that created human beings will fail your purposes amen. but in your eternal purposes hallelujah i'm in making a way for us to be your children Amen. again Amen. and we thank you that knowing so well that last sunday joshua in a very meaningful way Amen. would respond to your love Amen. in eternity hallelujah. you set him apart in christ to be your own hallelujah hallelujah we thank you for your word has power your word has power to heal your word has power i mean to make the lame walk your word has power i mean to make make the lame rejoice and dance but the greatest power of your word is make changing the heart of a human being hallelujah we thank you for eternity the best of his life amen for the great joy of each one of us amen you have changed the heart of our joshua amen you have made him your very own amen and god's mighty hands Alleluia. we as a family come amen. with our child Alleluia. we pray that god's watch will i shall always be amen. upon him amen. we pray that holy spirit amen. the in- the lord hallelujah. will tell in his heart and will counsel him hallelujah he will always learn to trust in jesus christ who is our advocate amen. in the presence of god being our high priest amen praise him hallelujah for your glory protect him in your grace amen. may he enjoy good life amen. good health joy of heart amen above all in his heart I mean growing in the in the in the great salvation of God Amen. fill Joshua with the power of the Amen. Holy Spirit Amen. we pray Uda chada ba 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 hallelujah we thank you for we know you and see me who birthed him and we thank you for the most parents and his siblings grandparents amen both sets of grandparents you brought him the spark and may the name in the may in the name of the lord joshua be blessed amen. in jesus name hear our prayer amen praise god praise god praise god by the grace of god i look forward to the day when one day that young man will stand here and preach god's word i'm glad we have recordings like this today so maybe 20 years from now we will rewind and watch the day he gave his heart to the lord stand here proclaiming the gospel Let's stand in the presence of God we're going to sing unto the lord and worship him we're going to sing of that same savior that i've been preaching about today the one who is coming as a king all hail king jesus he is coming to reign and joshua gets to be part of the kingdom because of his repenting and turning to the lord jesus christ there's only one name that is given under the sun above the earth by which all men might be saved and that is the name of Jesus the one that is worthy of praise let's sing unto the lord and worship him at that time if you need prayer for any matter in your life we invite you to come forward and the servants of god will pray for you praise god